Hello out there, Radio Land. This is Michael. This is the Street Preacher's Corner Podcast. The podcast that keeps on trying, no matter how low the numbers are. Honestly, I look at the numbers. Uh, I don't look at them a bunch. Uh, I've got a pretty good idea what the what the numbers are. And uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little intrigued sometimes about what resonates with people and what doesn't. And what gets the, the views and what doesn't. But I don't spend a whole lot of time. Or I, don't do, I don't do this. Uh, to get a crowd or to get a following or have a bunch of listeners or have a bunch of subscribers. I do this because God's word is like a fire in my bones and I don't know what else to do with it. And so here we are. And I, I, maybe I'll talk about that some more. You know, I, I, I tell you, <coughs> a guy asked me the other day, I'm going to get to the uh, Mark lesson 12 here in a minute. Uh, but a guy asked me the other day, or maybe a little longer than the other day, but he asked me, he said, why don't, you know, if, if all you Christians believe is true, that what waits for you on the other side of the grave is, you know, is, is, is heaven, um, then why do any of you uh, take vitamins? Why do any of you exercise? Why do any of you take medicine? Seems like you would be looking forward to death and doing every, you know, almost to the point of being suicidal. And um, there's a lot of different answers to that. Uh, I think... This has nothing to do with anything we're talking about, but I, I I'm going somewhere with this. So I think that um, that um, sometimes our gospel presentation is very shallow, and one of the reasons our gospel presentation is very shallow it is it is entirely done <coughs> um, from the standpoint of of self gain on the part of the person getting saved. You should get saved so that you can go to heaven, and. Although I think that that can result in some legitimate salvations, uh, some legitimate conversions, I do think it is a very poor way to explain the gospel. Um, the point of, of, of Christ going to the cross is not just so you could go to a good place when you die instead of a bad place when you die. The point of the Jesus Christ going to the cross was to destroy the power of death, destroy him that had the power of death, uh, to give you life and life more abundantly, to 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 uh, to deal with sin, the sin issue, and you going to heaven is just a side effect of your sins being washed away. The point of salvation is the forgiveness of sins, not just now I get to go live in a nice place versus going to live in a crummy place. Um, the point is you are a rebel. The point is you are you are a wretch. The point is you are separated from God by your sins. And the judgment of God is bearing down on you like a freight train. And Jesus Christ can take all that off of you and reconcile you back unto your maker and give you life instead of death and give you damnation or give you uh, 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 adoption instead of destruction. He can translate you from the kingdom of, of, his, of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. He can do all those things because all those things are a side effect or a side benefit of your sins being forgiven. Um, and I'm not one of those guys that says you gotta, you know, have this long conversation with people when you witness to them and tell tell them about all the all the ins and outs of this thing, all the mechanics of it, because they're not going to understand it. And I've been saved a long time, and I don't understand parts of it. But so, so my point with all this was was that this guy was he just figured, okay, well now that I've now that you know Mike's got this. This uh, really nice place to go when he dies. Why don't he go ahead and get on get on down the road with the with the journey? And the point of of it is not to get my eternity set and then go ahead and kick off. You know, the God is in favor of life. God gave me the life that I have right now. God has given me the life everlasting uh, that I also have right now. But I mean, the physical life I, God gave that to me. God is in favor of people living. God is not in favor of people dying. I know the Bible says precious in the in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. But the reason your death is precious in the sight of the Lord is that once you're on the other side, he will have your full attention, which you cannot keep here because you have so many other things going on. So the reason Christians don't commit suicide in mass quantities um, is um, there's no reason to. I mean, what would be the benefit of that? Oh, I get to heaven, you know, ten years earlier than I am than I'm than I'm going to go now. Okay, fine, well, whatever. But, but at, at the expense of what, you know, it, it's, not, it's not a that's not a uh, uh, an equation with, with with nothing but gains on it. So the reason that got me thinking about it is is that we have a element in our culture 
that is obsessed with death, that is obsessed with dying, that is obsessed with self-destruction and, and, and nihilistic tendencies. And it's not the Christians. It's not the people who have eternity to look forward to. It's the people who, generally speaking, have a, an eternity in the lake of fire to look forward to. And it's, it's odd to me that these people are, are the ones that celebrate and love death when death has no benefit for them whatsoever. It's kind of weird. Uh, we, 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 uh, we're going to get to Mark five at some point and we're going to take a close look at, at, at devil possession and the, and the trademarks of it and the characteristics of it. And you're going to see that it is rampant in your society. The only, the only way you can explain the, the behavior going on in your culture right now is, is that, that there are de- de- devilish forces at work, pushing people, pulling people, steering people. And you have a people that have been marinated and saturated in unclean spirits for so long that it's it's just it, it they have been conditioned to 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 value certain things. And so here we are. It's the twenty uh, it's not the twenty third century. It's the twenty first century. Yeah, uh, Duck Dodgers was in the twenty third century, uh, but it's the twenty first century, and we are b- circling back around to the same sort of uh, let's kill babies because it'll make the you know make it stop raining. Uh, it, let's kill babies because it'll make the, you know, because it'll be, let's kill babies. We're doing the same thing that the Aztecs did and that the Canaanites did and that all these pagan, godless, uh, death-obsessed cultures did and in which the death of innocent people was the solution for whatever. And not only that, but it's not only that they want all the babies to die, they, they want to die. I mean, everything they do leads to their destruction. Everything they do leads, not, and they, they won't even argue. It. There's no way you can you can you can uh, uh, be halfway intelligent and not have a you know a head full of devils and really think that hey, let me uh, let me uh, uh, you know let me uh, drive nails into my into my face. Let me let me put uh, all these all these you know piercings and stuff in me. Let's do it. Let, let, let me write all over myself. Let me all that stuff. Um, it is a it is a it is a mild form of self destruction, and so the so the, it's just weird. Like I said, it's weird. So the Christians are the ones that are hopeful. The Christians are the ones who 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 love life. The Christians are the ones who <clears throat> who generally speaking aren't in therapy. And the and the, and the world that thinks we're nuts and the world that thinks we're fools for living when we could be dead, they're the ones that are obsessed with death. And so you have two sides of their culture right now. Uh, it, I guess it's always, I guess it's been there the whole time. I don't know, but you definitely have a side to our culture right now, uh, that is celebrating death. They celebrate darkness. They celebrate death. They love it. They, 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 they are death worshipers. And so, so we, we haven't gone really that far past the Canaanites and the Aztecs and the Egyptians, which were all cultures that were death cults and our society and our culture is turning it into yet another death cult. And they're now saying the quiet part out loud as the saying goes. Well, I want to read you something written by my dear friend, Gerald Sutek. Before we get to Mark Mark, uh, 12, Mark Lesson 12. Now, what I can't do do is show you the pictures uh, that he includes in this. And that's unfortunate because this is entirely auditory. (coughs) Says the two, uh, the the title of this essay he wrote is Where Were the 7,000? And he quotes uh, 1 Kings 19.18, Yet I have left me 7,000 in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed unto Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. Now, I am at some point going to preach a message out of this very verse, uh, and then some, and then a, a verse prior in 1 Kings 18. And um, so I don't, I mean, this is not quite him stealing my material, but or me stealing his material, but I told him, I said, I've got a message very similar to what you wrote, and uh, maybe I'll do it at some point, but if I read this and then did that message, then you'd be hearing the same thing twice. So I'm going to give it some room, give you time to forget what he said, and then I'll say it, and I'll be like, oh, you're brilliant. Where were the 7,000? The two pictures below are to help you imagine 7,000 people. The picture on the left is exactly 1,000 people, the shape of a heart. And the picture on the right is 7,000 people at a graduation. That is an awful lot of people. Yet Elijah felt all alone doing the impossible job that he did on Mount Carmel against 850 false prophets of Ahab and Jezebel. Elijah did a superb job for the Lord on Mount Carmel and deserves to become the hero that he is among Bible believers. Elijah ranks with but edges out Adino the Esnite, 
2 Samuel 23, 8, in their courage to stand and take on 800 plus in a battle for either physical or spiritual. Elijah did not know the Lord had 7,000 who had not bowed the knee or kissed Baal. These were the faithful unto the Lord. These were the ones present in Israel who, if they had died, would have gone to Abraham's bosom. These faithful folk had no graven images in their homes, nor did they even make mention of the names of the heathen gods. These all had scriptures on the doors of their houses. They spoke of the Lord freely with their children and trained their children up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. They observed the Sabbath keenly and made their yearly sacrifice a joy in their households. These knew many of the Psalms and often filled their houses with the joy of the Lord, which was their strength. These 7,000 were proud to be the heritage of those who came out of Egyptian slavery and impossibly crossed on dry ground, the widest section of the Red Sea. Their ancestors ate man in the wilderness, crossed the overflowing Jordan again on dry ground following Joshua, and built a monument of stones from the riverbed to commemorate that event. Many of these 7,000 had made pilgrimages to that very spot to hear their dads tell the old, old story of the Jordan back in all the way up to the city of Adam, and all the people of Jericho watching from their impregnable rampart. So this congregation, numbering nearly eight times more than the combined number of false prophets on Mount Carmel, why did Elijah go alone? It's true that the good and wise Lord can put together any combination of events to test his prophets and single out his heroes. He certainly did with Gideon and the 300. 22,000 of Gideon's army were afraid and probably would have done more harm than good. Another 9,700 could not meet the rigid standard the Lord was ne- felt was necessary to fight his battle. One might elaborate on what they were afraid of or what the method God chose to test the last 10,000. But in the end, just think of how many crowns were counted cheap by the Lord's good people. So where were these 7,000 on the day that Elijah was sure could have been buoyed by a show of force? Where are all those cheap crowns? Did the Lord put them in cold storage to be kept fresh for another day? Or another unafraid soldier who wants to do something? Anything to be numbered among the heroes of the Lord? Lord, put one of those cold storage crowns away with my name on it, please. I will be there soon to claim it. I was honored to serve the Lord in the super church era when Sunday school attendance competition was the fashion of the day in the ministry. I have been part of such a competition topping 5,000. It was a thrill just to be numbered among them. But I can't help but wonder if that show of force could have been harnessed to accomplish much more for the Lord. For example, I know of a church that has a membership of 26,000 and some running even more. Suppose the pastor was able to rally this number to block vote against the woke curriculum in the public school system. Would the Lord be pleased with that? I heard one preacher tell an illustration about how many Baptist churches there are in Texas. Bragging, one preacher amazed another with a statistic that there are 10,000 Baptist churches in Texas. Wow. The other preacher responded, then why are there any bars in Texas? So where are the 7,000 in our day of service? I've taught for many years that the only reason a Christian soldier won't preach on the street is because of fear. Maybe some have been propagandized by the God of this world and have chosen just to pray and live for the Lord at home. Many, some, do not have on the whole armor of God. Maybe others are so entangled with the affairs of this world they just can't join the heroes right now. Maybe some pastors feel like they need the extra time in their studies in order they might wow their congregation on Sunday when they preach on Elijah and the false prophets. Just in case there are a few crown seekers out there, Brother Ken Lansing, his wife Frieda, and some hero preachers and pastors are going to be boldly marching down Beale Street in Memphis to counter the force of sin the world will display on March, or I'm sorry, on May 4th, 5th, and 6th during the music festival. This will be nearly 25 years of the consistent show of force against one of the world's vain celebrations. Does the Lord still have 7,000 that have not bowed the knee to the perverseness, weirdness, and wickedness of this present evil world? Ken Lansing can be reached at Ken at windfarms.com or 901-347-2601 or 901-283-3823. If I were not currently serving on the opposite side of the world, I would join you. I will be there in spirit. Signed, Gerald Sutek and the SWAT team for Christ. Well, I will not. I've been I've been to Memphis uh, for the Bill Street Blast. It is an amazing event. I have tried to figure out how I'm going to get Darnell there before uh, it's too late. Um, but we uh, currently on that same weekend, there's a festival uh, about an hour or 45 minutes south of us, and there's a fellow there that he really relies on us to come and help him preach. So we go do that instead. All right. So now we've done that. Now we've done that. Mark lesson twelve. We are still in chapter one. Never let it be said that we rushed through a thing. 
let me do some shifting around here so I can actually do stuff without dropping stuff. Mark chapter 1, verse 29 is where we're starting. I know just by looking at my notes that this is going to be a little bit more personal and anecdotal than maybe some other things. And I don't think a man should preach the stories of his life. But God does put you through things and God does mold you and shape you. And there's a there's certainly a principle in place where people who's, you know, by, by reason of use, they uh, exercise to discern both good and evil. And you're supposed to seek counsel from people like that. Well, we'll get there. Verse, verse 1, I'm sorry, chapter 1, verse 29. And forthwith, when they were come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's mother lay sick of a fever, and anon they tell him of her. And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her, and she ministered unto them. <coughs> so we know that Simon Peter uh, is Andrew's older brother, and apparently they lived together. Uh, they lived together with Peter's wife. So there's no mention of, of Andrew having a wife. But Simon Peter has a wife. And frankly, as the first pope, I think he's setting a terrible example. Anyway. Um, so they go to they go to Simon Peter's house, and Simon Peter's mother-in-law is there, and she is sick, specifically with a fever. You know, she had COVID-1 or something. Um, but it's the, So it's, Jesus heals her, and it's the first healing that's mentioned in Mark specifically, unless you count the, uh, the possessed guy uh, just a few verses earlier. But uh, so the first healing is mentioned is a physical healing of a physical infirmity. And the minute this woman gets healed, her, her name's not given. Uh, really, there's, this is the only time she's mentioned. She's not mentioned in the other Gospels, I don't think. Um, I could be mistaken. But anyway, uh, so the minute she gets healed, she gets to work. Now, there is a great scriptural principle there. Um, and and I, I will use my own life as an example. I got saved in April of 1995. And I started preaching on the streets in June of 1995. And did I know anything? No. Did I mess everything up? Absolutely. Did I say the wrong things? Did I misbehave? Did I act like an idiot? Absolutely. But I think that was a immeasurably greater benefit to me than if I had just sat on a church pew for the next five years while I tried to figure out what God wants me to do. I just I, I think a man gets saved. He ought to immediately find something to get involved in. And I don't know that I, I would take a, a baby Christian. I would turn him loose and have him, you know, head up a ministry. But, but crying out loud, man, go. So when I, the church that I got saved at, it was assumed that if you got saved, you would find something to get involved in. And so I got involved in a, a variety of things. Um, I went with men who were who were older in the Lord with me than me and, and were, were experienced and, and could you know, rein me in a little bit, and not everybody could, and so that, that sort of worked itself out, uh, as, as things like that tend to do. But I've actually heard pastors say uh, to young Christians that what they don't need to do is go get busy for the Lord. What they need to do is be in church every service, and I'm in favor of being in church every service. I've heard pastors say that the thing a young Christian should do is that they should sit in church every service and just listen and learn. Well, you can listen and you can you can be in church every service and you can still be involved in the ministry. This woman here, uh, once she was delivered from her fever, from her infirmity, which is a typology of her sin, she did not sit at the feet of Jesus and 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 learn. She got busy. And so I think that's a that's a great uh application. Get saved and get busy. By the way, in case you're wondering, anon, the word anon, A-N-O-N, means shortly or soon. So basically, as soon as Jesus is in the house, they uh, they say, hey, by the way, my you know, my mother-in-law's in the back bedroom, and you know, she's sick as a dog. That's probably not what they said. But anyway, verse 32, And even when the sun did set, they brought unto him all that were diseased, and him, them that were possessed with devils. And all the city was gathered together to the door, and he healed many that were sick of diverse diseases, and cast out many devils, and suffered not the devils to speak, because they knew him. And we talked before about how the devils always knew who Jesus was. It was no, they always recognized him on sight, somehow. 
One thing that I am not entirely clear on. Well, I'll get there. So it says that even when the sun did set. So they had left the synagogue. They had been attending the synagogue because it was the Sabbath. Uh, but the Sabbath, you know, ends at sundown because the next day ends at the Sunday. Like right now, uh, it's about to, uh, you know, in about, I don't know, looking at the sky, it looks like it's probably 20, 30 minutes. It'll be, according to the Jewish reckoning of time, it'll be tomorrow after tomorrow evening. That's not how we keep track of time. That's how they keep track of time. But anyway, so the Sabbath ends at sundown. And so they, you know, they, they you know, I guess you don't do a whole lot of walking around in the dark back then. Or now, I mean, you know. People, there's a reason people invented flashlights. Um, so anyway, they, they leave the synagogue and they go to Peter's house and the, his mom is there. And, and so uh, when, when, the, when the sun sets, the Sabbath is over and the prohibitions on, you know, uh, unnecessary travel that are in place on the Sabbath, those, those are, those are uh, also lifted. And so I don't know that Jesus would have uh, refused to heal on the Sabbath. I don't, I don't know that he ever did. I mean, you see several times where he healed on the Sabbath. Uh, but nobody came to him to get healed until the Sabbath is over, which I think is interesting. Um, it is interesting also to me that so many people in Israel at the time of Christ, I think I might have mentioned this before, so many people at the time of Christ uh, in Israel uh, had, uh, had, had illnesses, had sicknesses, and had devils. Um, in fact, there's so many, so much sickness and so much devilness going on uh, here that uh, look at verse thir- 31. Everybody in the whole town. Now, I'm sorry, verse uh, 33. Everybody in the whole town of Capernaum there uh, either has a devil or is sick or knows somebody who has a devil and is sick. And so you got people bringing their 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 possessed relatives and their sick relatives. And it winds up the whole city winds up being there. Um, apparently, okay, so pick up Deuteronomy 7. So you and I get sick. It is not, at least as far as I can prove from scripture, it is not necessarily the, uh, the result of sin. It is a result of something else. And, but, but in Israel, Illness, widespread illness, you know, plagues, pestilences, that sort of thing. Everybody being sick was was the direct reflection of the those people's relationship with God. Uh, verse seven, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy seven, verse looks like about verse eighteen. Uh, come on, man, really? There we go. Sorry, verse fifteen. Actually, so I'll, I'll back up to verse 14. Uh, you go through 7, the, God's talking about when they go in to possess the land, uh, that all this stuff's going to, if they if they obey God, that all these great things will happen. And if they don't obey God, then all this other stuff will happen. And uh, it says, verse 14, uh, or verse 13, He will love thee and bless thee and multiply thee. He'll also bless the fruit of thy womb and the fruit of thy land, thy corn and thy wine and thine old, the increase of thy kind and the flocks of thy sheep in the land which he swore to the fathers to give thee. Thou shalt be blessed above all people that shall not be male or female barren among you or among your cattle. So babies in the Bible are a blessing. Babies are a sign of God's favor. And barrenness is taken to be a reproach and a sign of something ain't right. Okay? Just, you know, stick a pin in that in our current child sacrificing culture we live in. But verse 15, the Lord will take away from the all sickness... And will put none of the evil diseases of Egypt, which thou knowest, upon thee, but will lay them upon all them that hate thee. So, the night they... I, I, I know the verse in here. I did not look it up. There's a verse that talks about how when they left Egypt, the night they left Egypt, everybody was healthy. And the idea was... And you don't read about any sicknesses while they're... Other than, you know, the state bite in, uh, in uh, numbers there. Um, uh, you don't read about any illnesses taking people down uh, on their way to the promised land. So, but when they get the promised land, if they obey God, then they'll be healthy. And if they don't obey God, then they'll be sick. Um, so like I said, New, New Testament uh, illness isn't you know, a result of devils necessarily. I mean, you, you could give me if you want to, uh, you know, outside the Gospels where all these strange things are happening. You give me a New Testament example uh, of, of, of devils being causing illness. 
But in the Old Testament system, in Israel, widespread illness was the result of sin. Now look at Deuteronomy 32. Deuteronomy 32. The Bible do say, 32 verse 17. That can't right. 32 verse 17. 16. They provoked him to jealousy. It's speaking about the, um, the, the the generation that left Egypt. They provoked him to jealousy with strange gods, with abominations provoked him to anger. They sacrificed unto devils, not to God, to gods whom they knew not, to new gods that came newly up, whom your fathers feared not. So, the, so devil activity is the result of devil worship. I mean, these things apparently, uh, when when the when the uh, when the, uh, the 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 children of Israel would would offer sacrifices to these gods, uh, something would show up to receive that worship. So, if you've got a lot of that going on in your culture, what you've got is you've got a high propensity of people being possessed with devils. And in Israel, you also have a high propensity of people being sick. So what you can gather just by the circumstances going on is that when Jesus Christ shows up on the scene, Israel is a mess. I mean, they are, they are being under the thumb of a, of a Gentile power, and they're sick, and they're full of devils, so much to the point that everybody knows somebody that's either sick or has a devil. It's wild, wild stuff. Uh, look at Psalm 106, just to just to round out that point. Just to round out the point that's on top of my head. Psalm 106, verse 37. They sacrifice, they, yea, they, well, let's back up here. Ming, the verse 35, but were mingled among the heathen and learned their works, and they served their idols, which were a snare unto them. Yea, they sacrificed their sons and their daughters unto devils and shed innocent blood even the blood of their sons and of their daughters whom they sacrificed from the idols of Canaan, and the land was polluted with blood. So you've got a mess going on when Jesus shows up. You've got people who have been messing with devils and have been uh, 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 taken on the ways and attributes of the Canaanites. And as a result, they're sick, and as a result, they're full of devils. So so devils seek out you know worship, and the devils seek out... Uh, uh, Places of worship. We talked about it before. Uh, verse, uh, so back to Mark. I was smart. I would use bookmarks. Of course, if I was smart, I'd do a lot of things differently. Uh, yeah, verse 35. And in the morning, rising up a great day, a while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place, and they prayed. There prayed. And Simon... And they that were with him followed after him. So, we, so we've got so we've got Jesus, we've got Simon, we've got, and they that were with him. So let's just say it's Simon and Andrew and James and John. So Jesus gets up before the sun comes up, and he's gone. And uh, getting up before the sun uh, comes up to to pray is a very uh, it's a very consistent practice in Scripture. Uh, I. I would say most of the time, maybe not every time, but most of the time, when someone is is depicted as praying and it mentions the time of day, it is early in the morning. And that is a pretty consistent practice in Scripture, and it is a pretty inconsistent practice in my own life. Uh, This is just me talking. Um, I I am doing good to get out the door. I do my Bible reading at night. I do my praying at night. I I do pray on the way into work. Uh, but I'm not getting up at fourth. I just know myself to know that I, I'm not, you know, I, I just, I'm not real good in the mornings. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm doing good to go and operate, you know, a vehicle and, and get to where I got to go without, you know, run into something. Um, but I can't say that it's a, it, that it's a, it, there's no examples that I give it in scripture because there's tons of them. Anyway, uh, so so he, so he gets up before sunrise to pray, and he uh, he he apparently he takes he takes the disciples with him, or they follow him, but they're not right behind him because later on he gets he manages to get away from them. In verse thirty seven, it says, uh, uh, "Simon, they were with him, followed him after him, 
And when they had found him, they sent him all me, all men seek for thee. So, so Jesus leaves and they go looking for him. And at some point afterwards, they find him now. Um, but when they find him, they find him with a crowd in tow because apparently there's more devils that need to be cast out and more people that need to be healed. Um, look, look, look for, uh, I'm trying not to belabor this point, but I think it might need to be brought out. Luke 4. Um, this is another another uh, telling of the same thing. And when it was day, he departed and went into a desert place, and the people sought him and came unto him and stayed him that he should not depart from them. So so he gets it before daybreak to go pray. He, does, he doesn't leave uh, the house till sunrise. So I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you, it's going to sound like a dumb question. It's going to sound like a trick question, but I've given this a lot of thought. Now, that doesn't mean it's not stupid, but it does, does just means that if it is stupid, it's a stupid thing that I've given a lot of thought to. Um, so Jesus leaves because Jesus wants to be alone. It's a profound thought. I know it's, 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 you know, I mean, we're wrestling with the very foundational bedrocks of theology here. The man leaves without these guys because he wants to be alone. Well, they get up apparently and they follow him at some point. They follow him at a distance or they, they deduce where he's going to be, or they, they run around looking around for him after the sun comes up, hoping to find him. But his, so his, so his, his goal was to be alone. I mean, even the son of God has got to get away every now and then. Um, but in this verse, in this passage, Jesus goes off to be alone. These guys follow him. They bring a crowd with them. And Jesus does not get to be alone. I'll think about that for a second. Jesus did not get what he wanted. Jesus did not get what he arguably needed because of the demands of the ministry. I mean, am I, am I talking to anybody other than myself? Okay, so we talk about Jesus Christ submitting to the will of the Father in Gethsemane. But he submitted to the will of the Father and the needs of the people all the time. I submit to you that Jesus Christ wanted to be alone because of whatever reason. He had spent the entire uh, evening, at least, healing people, casting out devils, and he got a little bit of sleep, and he gets up before anybody else does, and he leaves so he can have a few minutes to himself. And he does not get the few minutes to himself. Because the ministry makes demands on him. The will of the Father makes demands on him. These people need to be healed. These devils need to be cast out. And Jesus, you're the one that can do it. And so he goes and does it. So he didn't... He didn't... He didn't Run everybody off is my point. He didn't say, hey, man, listen, listen, guys, come back later. I need some me time. Come back later. I just spent all evening with you clowns. Come back later and I'll take care of your needs. You've waited this long. Just give me some space. Let me get some food in my stomach. Let me take care of the things I got to take care of to hold myself together. And I'll deal with you later. No, he didn't do any of those things. He submitted himself once again to the will of the Father. And he put himself last. And his legitimate needs came last. So, this is where it gets a little personal for me. For me personally, I won't say anybody else. I, I, I will say, I, I, let me start on this. I am a workaholic. The reason this podcast thingy exists is not because a bunch of people listen, because nobody is. The reason this podcast thingy exists is because Michael Shane Oliver is a workaholic and I cannot, I have not had a, I have not had a Sunday school class in several years. I had a Sunday school class for nine years or so and uh, I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. And I was preaching in super church and I was preaching at the truck stop and I was preaching on the street corner. I was preaching in the jailhouse. I was going and going and going. And that is my preferred way to be. So when people say, well, you got to come apart if you don't, else you'll come apart. I tend to be very harsh on people that say that because in my opinion, and this is not maybe even right, but in my opinion, most Christians don't do enough to where you need a break, right? Going to church three times a week. Oh, I really need a break. Uh, okay. I mean, uh, okay. Going, uh, 
I, I just don't get it because I am always looking to do more. And that's probably a, a reflection of some glitch in my character or whatever. Um, it has been suggested to me that I need to learn to enjoy Jesus' presence without being, without being, uh, without feeling like I have to do something. I don't do nothing very well. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't slack off well. I don't relax well. I don't know how to do it. I haven't known how to do it for as far back as I can remember. Um, so for me personally, there's always this, uh, this, uh, this tug of war between life and, and the ministry. And um, I, I'm just, like I said, I'm not a relaxer. That's not the issue. I, I would love to preach nonstop. I, I was in a situation a few years back where I was doing ministry stuff five, six times a week. I went to the Philippines and I preached 32 times in eight days. And I was running, I was running fine. I was running out of stuff to say. Uh, because there's not even time to even do any studying when you're cranking it out like that, you know. But that's, that's my, I'm, I'm, I'm just, I just, I gotta go, I gotta go, I gotta do, I gotta do, I gotta do. And like I said, maybe that's a, maybe that's a glitch of mine. Um, but, okay, so we go to these events, we go to the first Friday festival, we go to the shrimp festival, we go to the crawfish festival, we, we go to the football game, we go to the other football game, we go to the Halloween shindig, we go to these places where the crowd is. And, and I feel personally a, a responsibility for those events. I don't take those events lightly. Some of those events I will skip meals to be ready for. Um, I take it, I, I take it as a sense of responsibility for the people in downtown Brunswick to hear the gospel. And I know that I'm not the only saved person out there. I'm not even the only saved person that goes. Uh, but I've just never been able. So once we start going to the events, I then afterwards adopt a, a sense of responsibility for those events. And um, so then the well pump dies or the transmission falls out of a car or something. And, and, and maybe, maybe, maybe the right word is not guilt, but I feel a, a certain feeling of guilt. Uh, not a mess, a feeling of a of failure or, or, or conflicts or, or, or this tug of war in which, uh, it is hard sometimes for me to have a regular human being life because in the back of my mind, and this sounds going to sound stupid and it's going to sound like I'm trying to be pious, but I'm telling you, man, walk around with me for a while. This is exactly how I think it bothers me. For example, if I have to miss one of these events that I've committed to or one of these events that I, and it's not like anybody's, you know, taking attendance up there or where we go. It's not like anybody, you know, really cares that we don't show up. It's not like anybody's counting on me. Darnell's counting on me to give him a ride, but it's not, other than that, it's not, it's not like, you know, we're there, not there. I mean, whatever. But for me personally, I feel an, I feel a responsibility. And if I have to skip an event because of something in my regular life, I feel like I've failed, and it's dumb. Okay, it's dumb. Fine, whatever. We get rain. We get rained out a lot in the in the summertime. We get rained out. I don't know. You know. You know. Whatever. Uh, I don't know. Th- three or four first Fridays are in the summer, and 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 then you know, and, and then there's a hurricane blows through, or whatever. And, and even when that happens, I could look at that as God has given you a night off, Michael. Go do something else. But I tend not to look at it that way. I tend to look at it as, man, God, how could, did you not trust me enough to hold the weather back so I can go preach? Do you not want me out there? I, I, all this stuff goes through my head because I'm just whatever, okay? And uh, and so I feel, I, I, I'll give you a real life example. So uh, my son, uh, one of my sons is a martial artist, and he had a belt test that he had been working for towards forever. And they happened to hold it on first Friday. So, so my son wanted me to be there. You're going to say, oh, you're a terrible parent. Maybe. But I'm telling you the very real tug of war that happens in my life. My son wanted me to be there. I, in my heart, mind, in my heart, had made a commitment to the Lord and to the, 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 the gospel and to the people of Brunswick that hate me 
to go there and tell them one more time how Jesus died for them. And I don't take that lightly. And it's not something I can just blow off because I have another commitment. Because what I found is there will always be another commitment. There will always be something else that needs to be done or something else that has to happen that is always going to happen. At least for me. There will always be a broken car. There will always be a, a door that doesn't shut right. There will always be this going on, that going on, that stuff my family wants to do. And the tug of war in my life is how do I how do I do it all? If you don't have this problem, man, bless your heart. I I, I feel I mean I'm 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 happy for you. So anyway, Cameron's belt test was was coming up and and I, I he wanted me to be there, right? But I'd made a commitment and I felt like if I don't do this, if I don't go to Brunswick and preach then there are people who would have heard the gospel that won't hear the gospel because I'm not there. And I feel a responsibility for those people's souls, and I feel a responsibility for the gospel and the ministry that has been entrusted to me. And my children and my wife understand that, sort of. And I wish they were burdened like I am. So what did I do? I told Cameron, I will stay for your belt test as long as I can. But at a certain point, if you haven't tested, I've got to get in the car and I've got to go preach. Was that the right call? I have no idea. Because we went up there that that particular month and we preached and nobody got saved and nobody took a track and nobody cared we were there. You see? See, which which is the right call? I don't know. But I make that call over and over and over again. The tug of war in my life is between the ministry and everything else. My wife needs things. My kids need things. There are things around the house. That I, I live I live in a... You, you could take a working piece of equipment and drive it onto my property and it would immediately break down. And my wife and my kids are not go, go, go. Yeah, it is, it is, it is a matter of... of, of Conflicted loyalties is what it is. And my wife I said, my wife and kids, they are not go, 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 go. And and, and I and I have in times past, uh, I talked about before how we, we were preaching, you know, four or five nights a week, whatever. I have run my family ragged because of the demands of the ministry and my sincere desire to get the gospel to as many people as I can. And Brother Sutek says, life is ministry, and ministry is life. And he is a master at lots of things. But he is a master at, find, at incorporating ministry opportunities into his everyday life. Guy goes to the grocery store. He's going to preach. He's going to witness to somebody. He's going to pass out tracks. Why is at the grocery store? He's going to get a good gas. These are all things he has to do. And he finds ways to incorporate the ministry into them. And one of my shortcomings is I get so busy trying to do the thing that I'm trying to do that I don't think about it. I'm not always on my game, um, even though I should be, because I, because I, because I should be. So life is ministry. Ministry is life. It is always true, but it is not always the answer that people want to hear. And I, like I said, I, I do not have this part of life and this part of balance of life figured out. But if I follow Christ's example... My attitude will not be, so you don't see when, so Christ goes to be alone. See, I didn't, I didn't go too far off my topic. Christ goes out there to be alone, and he can't be alone because the demands of the ministry. Because there are people that need what he has. And if I'm going to follow Christ's example, my attitude will not be one uh, of, of, of resentment towards, towards life and the demands of life, or resentment towards the ministry and the demands of the ministry. Or frustration because I didn't get my way. Look at Philippians 2. There is a lot packed into Philippians 2. Now, like I said, all this, you may not have these problems. And, and you know, I'm happy for you, I guess. Um, we, went, we went down to Cocoa Beach once. Cocoa Beach is a place in Florida. And I went down there and uh, we're driving around. And we'd never been there before. And I was there for uh, uh, work and uh we're driving around, and and my wife is looking. Oh, there's a shop I can go to, and there's a boat, and there's a this, there's that. You know, there's there's how you get to the beach, all that stuff. And I'm looking around, and my mind is looking at 
traffic patterns and foot traffic and where can I stand and where will I not be breaking the law? And my wife looks over me and she goes, you're trying to find a place to preach, aren't you? It's, it's what I am. And she wanted to go be a tourist and I want to go preach. And that ain't the first time or the last time those two things have conflicted with each other. We've gone to a million parades where she didn't get to see the parade because I was busy passing out tracks and preaching. And I don't know what the balance is. I don't, I don't, I'm not willing to say, oh, well, I'll let somebody else get it. Somebody else doesn't have these obligations and responsibilities. No, God will not make two good things compete with each other. Philippians 2. I probably over-explained that to death. Philippians 2, verse 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being the form of God, thought not Robert equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found fashioned as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Look at, look at Matthew 20. I think that's where it's at. Our ministry is very... Um, intent. Intense is another word, right word. Tell you what, I will, I will stick a pin in that thought and I will come back to you when I have the right word. Matthew 20. Let's put it this way. By the time you, we go, we go to St. Patrick's Day and preach in Savannah. And it is an hour or so north from here. And so I leave here and I go to Darnell's house and I pick up Darnell. And then I drive an hour and then I park, you know, on the moon and pay some crazy guy, you know, an insane amount of money to park. I then walk for several miles, preach for a couple hours, leave, walk back several miles to my car, drive a hundred miles back drop off Darnell, and then come to my house. And um, other people have much more, uh, less labor-intensive setups. But my family knows, don't schedule nothing on the 17th, because Mike won't be here. And they don't like it, but there you go. 20, uh, Matthew 20, verse 20, Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life, a ransom for many. So Jesus Christ came not to have alone time. Jesus Christ came to serve people that needed to be served. He came to give people what the, the, that needed something what they needed, even at the expense of his own self. And that didn't just happen on the cross. It happened every place he went. Look at Mark 1 again. I'm going to wind this thing down because I've got to get on the road and take care of one of those obligations that I mentioned. Always driving. Always driving. Mark 1, verse 38. Uh, and he said to them, Let us go into the next town that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. So he came forth to minister, not to be ministered to. He came forth to preach. He came forth to do the ministry and the will of the Father. So the giving of his life, when, Jesus, when we talk about Jesus Christ giving his life, that wasn't that something that just happened once. It was literally the hallmark of his character, and it was uh, the hallmark of his ministry. It marked his ministry all the way through from the minute he leaves uh, the, 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 uh, the Jordan River all the way to Calvary, with obviously the culmination being in Calvary. I submit to you that the prayer time, in verse 35, let's look at it again. And in the morning, rising a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So he did have a little bit of time before everybody showed up. And during that time, he prayed. And I submit to you that the prayer time in verse 35 prepared him to not get his way in verse 37. We think about Jesus going, well, maybe you don't think about it this way, but we think of him as being go, 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 go. And there's plenty of that. There's the times where he wanted to be alone and he couldn't get it. 
and he wasn't mad about it. He submitted himself to the will of the Father. I said, okay. Okay. Verse 39, and we're going to stop there. He preached in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and cast out devils. Back to work. Jesus gets back to work. Well, guys, thank you for enduring my ramblings. Thank you for enduring my side quests. Thank you for enduring my speech and my voice. Um, even if nobody was listening, and nobody is, even if nobody was listening, I would still do this. And uh, I'll do this until I no longer want to do it anymore, I guess. Anyway, thank you for listening. This has been Michael. This has been the Street Preacher's Corner. Thank you for listening, and I will see you on the other side.